So I was amused to hear that last week you had a talk from someone at the Open University giving a, a balanced perspective on the pros and cons of being open. <laughs> now, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the first half of my talk, and at that stage I'm going to take a sharp left turn into some remarks that I felt compelled to make in response to Neil's talk in particular. Um, and then we'll just see whether there's time for me to finish up, or maybe we'll just stop and we'll do some questions and answers. So, Should Science Always Be Open? is the title I was given for a conference a couple of years ago. And I started out with, um, by the way, when I say science, this applies to all research. Because I'm a scientist myself, I have to admit, I often slip into saying science when I mean research. But this applies to everything. Arguably the greatest science, uh, scientist ever, Isaac Newton, not a humble man, but did come up with this very humble thing to say. It's one of the great insights. If I have seen further, he said, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Now, one of the reasons that's such a great insight is not only because it's true in itself, but because it is an example of what it describes. Because Newton stole that quote and greatly improved it from this one, from John of Salisbury in 1159. And note as I read this that he himself stole it from an earlier version. Uh, Bernard of Chartres used to say, writes John of Salisbury, that we were like dwarves seated on the shoulders of giants. If we see more and further than they, it is not due to our own clear eyes or tall bodies, but because we are raised on high and upborne by their gigantic bigness. It's an ugly word. Now, the ugliness of the word is important because Newton read that and he didn't merely reproduce it, he improved on it. He used something that somebody else had said, tidied it up, made it sharper, more memorable, and everybody now remembers Newton's version of it rather than either John of Salisbury's or Bernard of Chartres's or whoever he nicked it from before that. Because this is where creativity comes from. It's where all progress comes from in reality. Uh, the myth that you have, perhaps in some branches of pure maths, is the exception to this. Just one lone genius locked away in a room thinking about a problem, coming up with an answer. But that's not how stuff works for the rest of us. In any field of, of science or the humanities or the social sciences, always it comes from building on what other people have done. And you can see this in lots of fields. I'm going to be talking mostly about the scholarly field, but also commercially, if you think about the enormous progress in Silicon Valley over the last 10, 15 years in how to build valuable things using computers and networks, always comes from somebody building on an idea somebody else had. Uh, going back further, if you think about the Impressionists uh, in their little community in Paris, you know, one of them will come up with some new technique. Another one would modify that and do something better. Someone else would steal it again and do something better again. And this is how we ended up with the most loved visual arts probably that we have. And it's the same of all paintings, of, of all branches of the arts as well. Is always you get something by building what somebody else has done before. You can see it in music, even something as basic as the 12-bar blues, that becomes rock and roll, that gives birth to all the various forms of music that we have now. Always building on something else. It shouldn't be a surprise. It's how everything works. Uh, the Renaissance in Florence, if you go back further, maybe the greatest outpouring of all of the intellectual arts, artistic and scientific, again came because you had a community of people who were physically close together, able to see what each other were doing, build on it, extend it, do something better. And by the way, back then they had to be physically close together to do that. Now that we have the internet, we don't need to be close together because everyone is close to everyone else across a network. So we're in a very privileged position. So why is this? Why does it work out that way? It's because of this thing uh, in computer science we call it Net uh, Metcalfe's Law, which is that the value of a network doesn't grow in proportion with the number of nodes, but with the number of connections between them. In other words, with the square, the number of nodes. So here, you know, you double from these five to these ten, but you don't just double the number of connections, you get four times as many. As you grow the size of a network, you get more connections. The connections are where the value is, because that's where one thing sparks off another. And this is why it's brilliant to be alive today rather than back in the Renaissance, because we're now part of a network, potentially, of millions of, of researchers around the world. We can all spark off each other, learn from what each other are doing, build on it, make something better. And that's why it's always been the case, I think, with uh, scholars and librarians uh, and anyone really involved with this stuff, the natural tendency is always to share. And it takes an externally imposed force to overcome that natural tendency and to force people not to share. So this is how we used to make copies of papers. It was a, a difficult, 
uh, time-consuming, expensive thing. Uh, this is why we needed publishers. Uh, this is the way we used to store them. And, of course, this is the delivery mechanism. Now, all of that, until very recently, in only marginally improved forms, was how we did things. The arrival of the Internet, particularly the World Wide Web, has dramatically transformed that. And I would like to read you a statement from the very first public posting that Tim Berners-Lee made describing this new thing, the World Wide Web, that no one had heard of, and explaining why he thought that was valuable. Here's what he said. First ever statements about the World Wide Web. Here it comes. The project started with the philosophy that much academic information should be freely available to anyone. It aims to allow information sharing within internationally dispersed teams and the dissemination of information by support groups. Why did he want that? Precisely for the reasons I've been talking about, so that we can stand, if not on the shoulders of giants, and at least on each other's shoulders, and there are enough of us that we can reach the height of a giant if we work together. <coughs> so, and here's why this is important. This is a quote from Cameron Nalen in a, a blog post that everyone should memorize and have tattooed on the insides of their eyelids. He says, like all developments of new communication networks, SMS, fixed telephones, the telegraph, the railways, and writing itself. The internet doesn't just change how well we can do things. This is so important. It doesn't just change how well we can keep doing the same things we've been doing. It qualitatively changes what we can do. At network scale, as we grow the number of connections between things, the system ensures that resources get used in unexpected ways. At scale, you can have serendipity by design, not by blind luck. Now, that's a great quote, that last bit particularly that I highlighted in red, because it's a paradox, isn't it? Serendipity means a thing that you discover just by accident. It's like if you're a researcher, you try a lot of things, you throw six sixes, and uh, if, you, if you get all six, come up six, that's fantastic. It's a bit of serendipity, it's good luck. But when you grow the network, when you're dealing with millions of other papers, when you've got computers searching for connections between them, it's not like rolling six dice, it's like rolling a thousand dice. And then, of course, you get six sixes come up. That's not a surprise anymore. Your serendipitous outcome was done by design, not by blind luck. And that's the world we're headed towards. So that's what this is all about. It's got implications, needless to say, in all sorts of areas. Healthcare, uh, crucial requirements of agriculture, particularly in the developing world, uh, dealing with the results of climate change. I need scarcely go over all the reasons why innovations and growth in understanding and knowledge in the sciences and the arts is so crucial now of all times. So this is why I love this quote by John Foley, who summed this up in a single, well, two sentences. Your job as a scholar is not to get tenure. Your job is to change the world. That's got to be what we're trying to do, right? We're looking beyond just how's our career progressing year by year. I'm not saying that isn't important. What We need careers. We need to feed our families and children and, and all the other things. But ultimately, why do we do the things we do? It's got to be more than just getting to the next year of the same career and the next run. We're out to change the world. And that's why we all started, I hope, I'm sure, actually, is why we all started in the various careers that we're in, was in the hope of making a real difference. So, I hope everything I've said so far is pretty uncontroversial. Any, anyone going to disagree? Okay, so here's the problem. And this is where I go off piece. As I was listening to Neil's talk, and this is, let me be clear, this is no criticism of you at all. I found myself just overwhelmed with a growing sense of outrage that everything he was talking about, that the conditions that he works in, the problems he helps people deal with, are deliberate barriers placed in the way of that kind of progress. So that you have to make tools with a name like, can I use it? Well, we're trying to change the world here. The answer should be yes, of course. Why the hell not? And then when he started talking about the pyramid of compliance, at first I thought it was one of the Harry Potter books. And then I thought maybe one of the worst Doctor Who episodes. And then ultimately I re remembered where I'd heard it before. It's where they take Winston Smith in 1984 when he's going off to be tortured. They take him to the pyramid of compliance. It's a sinister thing. And as you carried on talking about this pyramid, I just found myself feeling like I, I couldn't not respond to the idea. Now again, I want to be completely clear. I'm not having a go at you. I realize that you're trying to help people in that situation. But I felt an outrage at the situation that they're in and that you're trying to help people with. It's like you're trying to help people navigate a maze full of lethal traps. But someone built that maze. And I would, so what I really want 
is while we definitely we need people like Neil and Becky to help us navigate those mazes while they're there. But can we please at the same time also be working on tearing those mazes down? And crucially, at least in our own work, let's not build any more mazes. At least let's make sure the work that we do is openly licensed and freely available for people to make new and better value out of. I know that the work I do in paleontology, which is my scholarly field, is no great shakes. I'm not going to change the world. But bits of what are in my papers, you know, fragments of work, data sets that I publish, specimen photos, 3D scans, whatever it might be, those are all things that other and better minds can use to do really good significant science. And I will not erect a barrier that will allow a publisher to prevent people from doing that. So, and, and of course then uh, the next phrase that I heard in your talk, Neil, was takedown procedures. And that made me think this is probably something the CIA uses as a euphemism for assassination. <laughs> uh, it's just frightening. Now, we talk about sharing. And in a, uh, I want to say something again that I said uh, at lunchtime, so apologies to a couple of you who heard that as well. When we think, you, we grow up uh, as children, I grew up in the 1970s, and, and so long before the internet. Sharing means you get less. So if I have two cakes and then my sister wants to share with me, what it means is she gets one of the cakes, I'm left with only one of them. Now, we're taught from a young age that sharing is good anyway, so that's good. Uh, but now we live in a very different world, don't we, where because when you copy something across the internet, you don't lose the copy that you've got, you keep it. When I start out with two academic papers and you want one of them, I'll just tell you what, I'll give you both, and I've still got both. Now, this is a crucial, crucial, crucial difference that an economy where you can make an infinite number of copies of things at zero cost functions in a fundamentally different way. It's a magic machine that creates value out of nothing. It's the holy grail for economists, except economists don't like it because it spoils all the models that they, they <laughs> learn to work with. But in terms of what it does for our lives and the lives of people around the world, I can hardly overstate how revolutionary it is. You can make wealth out of nothing, and that's what sharing is. So in that context, what is copyright? It's a machine for preventing the creation of wealth. Holy crap. Let's, <laughs> let's not prop that up. So, and that's why the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which was uh, published in 2003, it was the output of a meeting of the people who really gave birth to the modern open access movement. Uh, very well worth reading the materials on their website, but one of the statements that stays with me was this, copyright has no role in scholarship. Now, obviously in the world we live in today, it does, because things are impeded by copyright. We do have all these drags to deal with. You have to waste your time having these endless meetings about policies for what's going to be allowed. You... Um, are employed because of it, I suppose, so maybe, you, <laughs> maybe it's not so disastrous for you. But you could be off doing something more exciting, right? <laughs> yeah, there's, there are always other things to do. So these drags exist only because they're externally imposed. There's nothing about the nature of the universe that imposes them. Now, that's different from cakes. You know, I would love to give every one of you a cake, but I couldn't have made enough cakes to do that, or at least it would have taken me a long while. If I just made one cake and I ate it myself, none of you would get everything, and I sadly wouldn't be in a position to give you each a cake. But if I write a paper, absolutely I can give each of you that paper, and it costs me nothing, and it costs you nothing to pass it on to all your friends as well. We must, if we're going to solve the significant problems of the world, the health problems, the agriculture problems, the climate change problems, everything else, we must take the opportunity to create free wealth out of nothing. And we must find ways to overcome the barriers deliberately imposed by those who want to prevent us from doing it. How am I doing for time? I've got a couple of minutes. I'll just do a few more slides and we'll see where we land up. Thank you for your patience, by the way. So, the word publish means make public. Publishing is meant to open up the world. We're in this stupid world instead where something as crucial as the ability to detect counterfeit anti-malarial tablets, where a developing world doctor needs to know, can I give these to my patient or will the patient die? That doctor cannot find out the answer unless he's prepared to give a publisher $36, which heaven knows how many months' salary that is where the doctor is, in order to access material that a scholar created for free and gave away. That won't do. So, 
uh, why is it happening this way? Obviously, it all comes down to money. It's now a well-rehearsed fact, I imagine you've all seen this before, that the major scholarly publishers, the big four, all have profit margins in the region of 32 to 42 percent, which means that by selling work that they did not create and that they did not peer review, and in most cases that they did not edit, they are taking out a third of all the money that's paid in subscriptions. Every time you spend $3,000 on a subscription to an Elsevier journal, $1,000 of that goes straight into the shareholder pockets, they walk away with it. And by the way, of the other 2,000, I imagine a good 1,000 of it is spent on enforcing the paywalls and the lawyers who deal with it and the um, public relations people who try to find ways to make it look acceptable. This is what we're dealing with. Now, unfortunately, because of these large amounts of money they're taking, these very profitable businesses have a lot of money to spend on lobbying. And they have full-time people, you know, on the hill in Washington, constantly spending literally their whole careers trying to persuade senators to pass laws that are favourable to them. That's a really tough thing for us to fight against. Uh, because the other thing is they have very concrete numbers. Elsevier can go to people and say, uh, we generate a business that's worth $2 billion a year. Uh, please don't pass open access laws because they will reduce that and then we'll lose economic value to society. What's hard for us is we want to be able to go to the same people and say, pass the open access laws or policies or whatever they may be, and the result will be an economic benefit of $300 billion or whatever the number is. Our difficulty is that big question mark there. It's incredibly hard to estimate an opportunity cost because we can't tell what is going to be built and what kinds of benefits we're going to get until it's happened. Just as when Tim Berners-Lee made that first posting about the internet, uh, about the World Wide Web, sorry, he had no idea that we'd end up in a world that has eBay and Wikipedia and all these other things that add so much value. He couldn't see that, so he couldn't put a price on it. Thank heavens he couldn't, or maybe he would have tried to patent it. Instead, he gave it to the world, and that's why we have the internet we have today. So it's very hard to say what the cost is of not being open. All we can say is we know from experience that it's huge. So we cannot allow these kind of costs to continue. We must do what we can do to find ways to avoid the trap of copyright and crucially to avoid imposing it on other people whenever it comes to us to make a decision. We're not just groping towards cost savings when we um, implement open access policies. We're not just looking to save money on subscriptions. We're doing much more than that. We're trying to transform what research is, what it's used for, and the whole state of the world, literally the state of the world. So my question was, should science always be open? That title is a lie. The true title is, of course, science should always be open. And with that, I finish with about one second to spare. Thank you. <laughs>